Good evening and welcome to Dakota Baptist Church. It's good to have y'all with us tonight. I'm excited to be here tonight. I've been actually thinking about it all day, really. And it's good to see y'all here with us. Good to have you with us online, the ones that are tuning in with us. Uh, even perhaps the ones that will watch uh, after this episode or this <laughs> particular message is already been put out there. So at a later time. Generally, we start out with just prayer requests and praises. I got a couple of things. Uh, I'm sure I don't have everything. First of all, we need to be in prayer for Sharon Haynes. Uh, I'm not sure what all is going on. There's some uh, unspoken health requests and needs there. So uh, be in prayer for that for her. Uh, continue to pray for uh, the Freeman and the Cook family with the recent loss of Ms. Coro. Uh, continue to be in prayer for Charles Westerby as he continues to recover after his fall. He seems to be doing pretty good. So it looks like he's got a pretty healthy prognosis, which is great news. Uh, continue to be in prayer for Judy Boyette. I've not heard any updates on her. I'm not sure if she's still he's still in rehab. He's still going to go home Wednesday. Still in rehab, looking to go home Wednesday. Continue to be in prayer also for uh, Vicki Mouse and uh, as she just kind of prepares to go and be with the Lord. Are there other prayer requests and or praises tonight that I don't have that we need to be getting on here? Not all at one time, y'all. <laughs> yeah, be a, be a prayer for the Cruz and family. Uh, Tim is the father of a childhood friend of mine. I grew up going to daycare with him to watch me and my sisters and Tim was the father and uh, he's had at least one stroke they believe he may have had more than one and so be in prayer for him um, Harold Eason that's right Harold Eason and We had, a, we had a pastor in, in Pakistan that actually asked us to pray for him as well. And I can only imagine how rough that situation is. And he, he does that quite a bit. He's got a lot of different uh, prayer requests and needs all there, which is good because they're in an area of the world where persecution is really an everyday thing. And so uh, be in prayer for not only that pastor, but different missionaries in parts of the world where they're not as welcome as we are. I know that right here in the U.S., persecution is coming. The pressure is coming. In fact, it's already here. It's waiting at our doorstep right now, and we need to know how to battle that, okay? And how do you do that? Trust in Jesus. Stand firm in what the Bible says. Every word of Jesus, that's true. We know how it ends, don't we? As believers, we know what to expect. We know that it's coming, and we know that to be followers of Jesus, we ought to be hated like Jesus. So we need to be ready for that. Absolutely understand that that's coming if it's not already closer than we know. Are there others? All right, let's just turn it over right now. Take this time and just give it to God, okay? Dear most gracious and heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you for the fact that we can still meet in your house publicly tonight. We thank you for uh, social media platform to be able to share the message with people that otherwise might not have access to it. Lord, we pray that you would bless the word and just pass it out. Share it, Lord, as you call it to be shared. And Lord, we know that your word never goes out and returns for it. So Lord, we just trust you with that and we pray that you continue to give us courage and strength. Encourage us, Lord, to be out there continuing to share your word no matter what type of persecution may exist no matter what's coming help us to stand firm in your word and to know that you indeed are God and Lord truly if we have you we have everything we need Lord we pray tonight uh, for Sharon Hanks and some unspoken health needs Lord that being said we also pray for Nina and uh, I understand that there was some good word uh, last week but uh, I'm not sure what that was so uh, anyways, Lord, we know that you're up to you're up to your work on that, and we just thank you for that. Lord, we pray for the 
Freeman and Cook family. Lord, as they're together this weekend, we pray that you would bless that time of fellowship. And we pray that you continue to give them grace to cope with the uh, recent loss of the so loved Miss Cora Freeman. Lord, we thank you for her life and her testimony to anybody that knew her or that knew that she loved you. And so, Lord, we thank you not only for that, but Lord, the peace that you give us and letting us know absolutely where she is, even tonight. Lord, we thank you for the, the, the good word of the recovery of Charles Westerby. And we pray that you continue to just wrap your arms and love around him and continue to heal him. And uh, that he'll be able to get back to working uh, like he likes to do in no time. Lord, we pray for Miss Judy Boya as she continues to recover uh, after what I understand is a mild heart attack. Uh, and I pray for Vicki Knauss, Lord, that she would find peace with you and have no doubt in her mind or her heart uh, where she's going on the other side of life. And Lord, we pray that you would just help her to be uh, caught up in your grace, your love and your mercy, Lord, and your forgiveness in this time tonight. Lord, we pray for the Cruising family, as we pray for Tim in the recent uh, stroke that we know he's had at least one. And Lord, we pray for the recovery and good prognosis, good word. We pray for good doctors and nurses to be around him, to know what to do and how to do it. We pray for Kathy and the kids uh, in that situation. We just pray that you would create a time of healing and peace in that family, a time of grace. Bless the Lord that they may not they may not fight to have any issues in the house. Lord, we pray for Harold Eason uh, as he goes to see a surgeon, a kidney surgeon. They've recently discovered a blockage behind his eye and possibly some, some sight loss. Lord, we know that you can restore sight to a blind man. So Lord, tonight we just trust you and we ask you to, to show up and bring back the right doctors and nurses and staff uh, around Harold's care as well continue to bring about healing in him and his life. And Lord, we just thank you for the opportunity tonight to be able to, to pray to you, Lord, to know that you alone are God. You hear every word that we lift up, both, both verbally, loudly, and Lord, every word from our hearts, as we thank you sometimes in secret, sometimes in quiet. Lord, we thank you for knowing everything of our heart. We pray that you would guide us, uh, to repent of sin that's in our life. Forgive us, Lord, the times that we've fallen short of you, Lord, and guide us into your new path. Lord, the path of straightness, uh, righteousness, Lord, that only you have to give and that we so desperately need. It's in Jesus' name that we pray and give thanks tonight. Amen. All right. So right now we're going to turn it over to some praise and worship time. So if you would stand with us and sing. Those of you tuning in live, you're free to do the same thing. Uh, if you won't get in trouble wherever you are, you're in your kitchen, your bedroom, your bathroom, whatever, uh, it doesn't matter. Uh, we just get to praise God right now. We want to invite you to do that with us. Thanks.
let it shine, this little light of mine. I'm gonna let it shine, this little light of mine. I'm gonna let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Everywhere I go, I'm gonna let it shine. Everywhere I go, I'm gonna let it shine. Everywhere I go, I'm gonna let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. All through the night, I'm gonna let it shine. All through the night, I'm gonna let it shine. All through the night, I'm gonna let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. There's still a lot of mine. I'm gonna let it shine, this little light of mine. I'm gonna let it shine, this little light of mine. I'm gonna let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine.
Good evening. So I like to start off with this positive social media thing. I think it's really important that as we see people encourage others with various pictures or scriptures or whatever, that we like those things and that we continue to progressively push them forward as it just continues to be more of God's agenda than it does our own. I like this picture. How sweet is this? It says right there, life is peaceful when you rest on the promises of God's word. You see that baby sleeping on the Bible? That could be all of us. If we would trust in the word of God, we could take peace and rest in everything life would ever throw at us. <clears throat> this one kind of surprised me because I wasn't aware um, that there were 4,200 religions in the world. But right here, there's a picture I want to share with you. It says, there are 4,200 religions in the world, but only one empty tomb. There's only one. There's all these different religions and it's gonna hurt people's feelings that Christians share the truth that there is only one God and it is the God in heaven, the Father, right? There are all these other, you know, their religions, their idols, their, their money, their things, none of it amounts to anything in the end. There's only one. Check this out, the top picture is of a man uh, giving what looks like a little cat some milk. And it says right there, the more you feed your sin, the greater the beast becomes until finally it eats you alive. And you can see the picture of the lion consuming the man in the picture below. And that's a great picture of what sin does. If we allow it to, uh, it will consume us and take over more and more of us as we move forward. Lastly tonight, Pray for eyes to see others as Jesus does. Y'all ever pray for that? You ever pray that you will see people, understand people, love people like Jesus does? Because I do. You know, a lot of times I, I want to see people in the way that I remember people. I want to see people in the, the issues I may have had with people in the past. Anybody guilty of that tonight? You know, it's hard for us sometimes to say, Jesus, let me see them like you see them. Let me see others the way you see them. Started hitting some lines of questioning as I prepared this. God definitely helps, as always. The question is, are you ever fascinated by the way we will remember a time frame because of, the, of an experience or something that we have gone through? Excuse me. You know, a lot of times, what do I mean by that? Well, uh, maybe we'll remember something by something bad that happened perhaps in the winter. You had to push a car 30 blocks to get it home. And so you kind of remember that and you talk about that. And you remember how times were both before that and how times were after that. Perhaps uh, the passing of a friend or a loved one, it causes you to, to speak about that in, a, in the presence of both before and after and a lot of times we will use that as kind of a, a timeline memory of both things before and things after. And we'll, we'll, we'll even remember events afterwards based on that one event, okay? Lots of different things that we go through in our lives. A new job, maybe you pick up a new job and you start to remember things before you worked at this place or, or things after uh, you started at that place. We actually get to a place where we will use the event to separate the time before versus the time after. And I think that that's pretty fascinating. One thing that you may not know about me is that I am absolutely fascinated by the, chron the chronological order of the Bible. I'm fascinated by it. I, I want to know more and more and more about it, and I want to know how it happened, but in the order in which it did, because it helps me really wrap my head around it. Do you think that God gives us that by mistake? You know, I think that God does everything he does on purpose. And though we may not always understand that, especially at the time, you know, later on as we get to know him more and more, we realize that God is incapable of making mistakes. So if we believe that, then we know that our memory attached to time frames and things both before and after can't possibly be a mistake either. 
Have you ever had a desire to understand the Bible using biblical chronology? Really just putting it together in the order in which it happened, in which it unfolded. It was interesting to me as I started out, I've been uh, reading a new book I'm going to share with you in just a second, but uh, this book talks about the creation of the book Genesis and how it took more than 2,000 years to put together the pages of Genesis. I was unaware of that. Okay. I'll share a quote with you here from that book. The Bible is unique when compared to all other holy books of the world's religions. One reason the Bible is different is the fact that it is the only religious book rooted in past history that also predicts future history. All other religions of the world, unless they rely on the Bible at some point, do not rise or fall whether they are historically true. These other religions are based upon a philosophy or an ethical way of life and do not stand or collapse on whether they are historically accurate. Interesting, right? Well, the Bible certainly contains theology and ethics, still, it stands on whether what it says actually happened in history or will occur in the future. Because the Bible is God's revelation of Himself and it presents His outline and interpretation of history. It follows that biblical chronology is included in God's Word and is an extremely important element in His revelation to mankind. Now that book is called Charting the Bible Chronologically. And it's, it's a very interesting read so far. I'm not very far into it yet. And it, it references this, and I, I took it a little, a little further. Um, if you will look at Hebrews chapter 11, it actually says in most study Bibles, and it might even say it in other Bibles as well, but it says right there in a caption, faith in action. Okay? You get to see what faith looks like to a believer in that time frame. And I'll give everybody a second to get there. It's all right if you don't want to look it up, I will have it on the screen. Kathy will be putting it up there in just a second. Okay. And it starts with this. These two, these two first words are probably and perhaps the most important. By faith. We understand that the universe was formed at God's command so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. The elements in which the world came together with were not visible. In fact, we know that in the beginning it was darkness. God called all the elements together. His, his voice spoke them into existence. Everything that you see was made of material that was not visible to our eyes. Verse 4 says, By faith, Abel brought God a better offering than Cain did. By faith, he was commended as righteous when God spoke well of his offerings. And by faith, Abel still speaks even though he is dead. By faith, Enoch was taken from this life so that he did not experience death. He could not be found because God had taken him away. For before he was taken, he was commended as one who pleased God. I think about that often in my daily walk. Do I live a life that pleases God? And some days I can honestly say, I feel like I, I, I might. I don't really get to that place a lot where I'm like, I certainly do. But I do cross the paths of days where I know that I don't. And so therefore I know that I still have some work to do. Verse 6 says, And without faith, it is impossible to please God, because anyone who comes to Him must believe that He exists and that He rewards those who earnestly seek Him. I think about this from the standpoint of somebody who prays uh, almost out of, a, out of an anger. They pray as a last resort and they decide to turn over to God, they're like, well, okay, if God exists, I'm gonna pray this prayer and things are gonna to come together. And it's not always the way it works, right? It's just, that's not who God is. And a lot of times we get mad at God because we feel like God allows bad things to happen. We feel like God is allowing horrible things to happen to some people while other people seem to walk away and just kind of escape and give, give my life fairly easily. And the truth is that God had to allow bad things to happen because God allowed free will. And free will, I get caught up in that, that the reason bad things exist is because mankind brought bad things into existence with a little bit of temptation from Satan. 
I'll tell you, there are some things that I don't understand about Scripture. I hope, I hope I'm not alone in that. If you ever feel like you understand everything, then you need to be up here and I need to be listening to you. Uh, whoever that is, right? God has called us all to preach and to share the word. And there's a lot of parts of the Bible that I want to understand better. Absolutely, I do. And there are some things that I have a lot of work to do on. There's actually parts of Scripture that I don't have any knowledge of. I'll have people sometimes quote Scripture to me that I've not frequented. Anybody ever in that boat? So I'm trying to make sure that as I make trips in Scripture, that I go a little further each time. Kind of like moving into a new neighborhood. You know, at first you kind of figure out where the grocery store is and how far away from your house the gas station is to fill up your car. But after a while, you got to find a job. So you got to get out there and go just a little bit further. Point I'm trying to make is that's exactly what we have to do in Scripture. And though I may not know everything, I will share, you, share with you the things that I do know. The first thing that I know is that God is the author and creator of everything. And if you can get your mind wrapped around that, the rest of Scripture is really not that hard to understand or believe. But I'm telling you, you remember that those first two words I shared with you out of that Scripture passage, by faith. You have to have faith. You have to have faith that everything that God says is true. You have to have faith that when you pray, that God actually exists, that He actually hears you, and that He actually has a plan to help you get through whatever it is you're dealing with. I know that the old world in Scripture versus the new world times were separated by a flood. Y'all remember this? 40 days of severe rainfall. And I want you to know that before that time, as Noah was given the command to put together this ark with exact measurements of how God wanted it to be. He's building this ark in the middle of a place where there's, there's no real fear of water to anybody that's passing by. They called this man every name in the book. They thought he was a complete idiot because he was building this huge ship. And when asked why, he probably shared with people the truth because God said to him, and people were like, what a moron. People thought that this guy was a fool. I'm sure they mocked him. They mocked his family. Probably hurled insults as they walked by the house. But it didn't stop Noah from building this huge ship. And everybody thought he was crazy. Until one day, after all the animals and the family boards this ship, God shuts the door. And all of a sudden the skies open up and the heavens start to rain down. And people don't think he's so crazy now. But it's too late. The Old Testament was primarily dealing with the prophecy of the Messiah, where the New Testament was its fulfillment. The New Testament's all about Jesus. And so is the Old, if we really focus and pay attention to it. Do you know that today's physical date is actually based on Jesus Christ alone? The date today. The date every day, which points the entire world, regardless of where their minds have settled with whether or not they believe or reject Christ, it sets their mind on the fact that Jesus Christ is very real. The date is actually symbolic of before Jesus existed and after his death. Check this out. You want to talk about something that will make the world very angry? Scientists around the world will hear this and scoff at this church. Many scientists said the world will tell us that the world is millions of years old. Y'all hear this? All the time we listen to some kind of world history. But the Word of God simply does not support that. Does it? Chronologically speaking, it doesn't support it at all. More like thousands of years old. Right? And so the question generates for most people as they cross that point, how can God possibly do that? Outside of the fact that He is God alone, right? We've got to get our minds wrapped around that He is God. He does what? Whatever He wants. He's God. What about looking at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 from a reverse perspective? 
And this kind of hit me. It was kind of interesting today. And it says right there at 517. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone, the new is here. That's talking about our life, our life being changed after we accept him, after we know him. The old things that used to matter, your priorities change, don't they? The things that used to be important, all of a sudden you realize don't have near as much value. The, the schedule for the week and the things you've got to do, all of a sudden becomes more of a blurry picture than something you just fix at your mind on. But when you think about old things, could God not create something to look older than it actually is? I mean, after all, it's his creation, and he indeed is God. Maybe he did that to baffle us, right? To cause some to doubt, even though they had the word to be able to base time on. But he knew that people would still use the rings on a tree to determine how long the tree was. How many trees were around when God created the world? You notice that scripture doesn't share that. But to have a full grown tree, I'm guessing that in the Garden of Eden, these trees were not little bushes growing out of the ground. Because you'll notice that many trees had fruit. They, they were seed bearing trees, seed bearing plants. That doesn't just happen overnight, but it can be called into existence by the voice of God. You know, I, I think it's funny because when it comes to gardening, I, I can't do it. I'm not very good at it. If somebody was actually to come out and say, oh, you should try to grow these, it would be almost impossible to kill them. I believe I'd find a way. But God called things into existence. And all he had to do was speak. He didn't have to get angry. He just spoke. Let there be. And whatever he said after that, it was about. It came about from the word of God. Understanding the chronologic time frame helps us to understand how we got our Bible. And believe it or not, these weren't just found in libraries without some work, right? God had to inspire this into existence. And the world, the world struggles with this book. Why? Because we realize in the church we call it a, a God-motivated, a God-inspired word. We believe that every word in Scripture came from God. But the world says, how could every word in the Bible come from God if man wrote it? Well, because God inspired man. And man wrote it. In several different events, Scripture was written from points of view. You'll get to see that as you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you get to see different standpoints because the story changes because where one disciple might have been this close to Jesus, the other disciple was over here. Wouldn't it be normal to assume that the one that was closer was able to get more information than the one that was further away? Of course. The closer you are to the source, the more you see it also helps us to understand the periods of time where the books were written, as I shared with you about Genesis, which took quite a bit of time to come about. We get to understand why God sent Jesus to us in the flesh in an overview of purpose in John 3, 16 and 17. You know what, I'm just going to go there real quick because I, I, I feel like that's what God's telling me to do, so I'm going to listen. And if you're free to turn there with me. Most of us know John 3.16 already, but uh, sometimes when we get to 17, we have, we have some that forget. I had to learn this too. In fact, one of my neighbors actually challenged me to learn 17. 16 says, For God so loved the world, and I'll tell you right there, I'm going to stop for just a second. If you were to replace the words, the world, with your name personally, this verse would still be 100% true. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Verse 17, here goes the purpose that I was just sharing with you. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. And Jesus had a purpose, a plan, a calling. God didn't just throw his son down to earth and say, make it happen. God had planned it all from the very beginning. We get to learn that there is only one way to the Father, and it is through the Son. It's not based on works. 
It's not based on a, 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 an attendance chart for how often you go to church. You know, we did that with our youth for a while. We would say that if they wanted to participate in some of the events, that they would have to come to church because it was only fair, right? A lot of times, if you didn't do something like that, uh, you would have kids show up that just wanted to be a part of something when it was time to go have some fun. And we would reward the kids with, you know, a day at Wonderland or a day at whatever. But you, if you weren't setting ground rules for that, you would have a lot more kids show up the day of the activity than all the events that led up to the work to obtain the activity in the first place, right? When it comes to being a disciple of Christ, you can't just go to church on Sundays and start to tally up in your bedroom how many church, how many church Sundays you've attended and reach a certain number and acquire heaven. It has to be a personal decision to whether or not you trust that God is real. And you either believe one of two things. Don't let anybody fool you. Don't let anybody say, you know what, I'm not really sure. Because that's crap. It's a complete lie. It's total garbage. The truth is you either believe that God is real and he does exist, or you don't. There is no halfway. It's one or the other. Understanding the time frame of scripture itself helps us to know all we can about God and give us more clarity uh, of, of his three persons, right? The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I got to thinking about this earlier, that God actually knows every single thing there is to know about me. Shouldn't I get to spend a little bit more time getting to know more about him? And that what love looks like if you really love somebody, even as, even as your best friend, don't you care about what they care about? Don't you want to know what they like? What they don't like? What's their interests? How do they spend their time? Because I'll tell you what, if you don't have the interest in knowing anything about God, you might not really love him. You might love the idea of loving him. And that's something that we all have to address. As I believe we all aim to grow in our wisdom, let me share these verses with you to, to prepare us to leave here tonight. And I'll tell you right now, I, I believe this is only the beginning of chronological speech as it comes to the church and the Bible. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. Verse 6 says, In all your ways, submit to him, and he will make your path straight. Now let me tell you the true answer to how you're going to do either one of those things is faith. You believe that he's real. You believe that he's current. You don't have to make him up in your mind. He, he does exist. He is there. And in your ways, you submit to him. You pray for his guidance and his wisdom on what you do next. And you wait for an answer. Don't get impatient like Kyle does. I do, I get impatient sometimes. I want God to give me an answer right now because I feel like I deserve it. And I start to ask myself, who do I think I am? To demand anything from God. Our position is to be behind him, not in front of him, which means that when we pray, for clarity and direction, it's actually our calling to be quiet and wait on him to speak. With solid confirmation, I want you to check out Philippians chapter 4, verse 7. And it says right there, it's going to be a confirmation of what we just read. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. We don't have to know everything. In fact, the truth is we're following God. We're not entitled to know anything. And that's what's hard about it. When God says move, we have to move in faith. Faith becomes our vision. Faith becomes our motivation, our encouragement to actually do what we're called to do. So let me ask you this question. I'm not looking for anybody to answer it to me, but answer it rather to God himself. Do you believe is, is your heart and your mind wrapped around the truth that God is real, that Jesus Christ exists, and that Jesus was sent to offer all of us a way out of sin, to offer us all a way out of hell? 
Because if you read scripture and you learn this isn't even part of the time frame so much as it is just an understanding. The Bible says that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. It goes on to say that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. Do you believe that God exists? Do you believe that eternal life is offered through His Son, Jesus Christ? Do you believe that if you call on the name of the Lord, that you will be saved? And as we battle through the pages in chronological order, and I want to start that, provided that God allows that. It's got to be His way, not my way. But if He does, we're going to continue on and try to get a little deeper each week. But we have to understand the very basic foundation on which everything is true in us. As we put the church information up here tonight for everybody watching live, I want you to know how to contact us. And I've got a gentleman I need to reach back out to, so if you're listening tonight, I haven't forgotten about you. I did get your voicemail, and I will be reaching out as soon as I can. But you can send us ground mail. You can write us an email. That secretary, bsbc63 at gmail.com, goes right to the secretary of the church. And then I've got my own personal cell phone number and my email on there that you can reach out to as well. And if you have any prayer requests or prayer needs, uh, please feel free to share that. In fact, you can just say, please pray for me and leave me a name. God knows who you are and he knows what you're going through. So that's easy enough for us as a church to do. But as you in the house tonight, you sit there, those of you listening as well, as you contemplate the question, do you believe? If you've never made a choice to come forward based on the answer to that question, I want to challenge you and encourage you to do that tonight. As the Word of God just sits there and tugs at your heart, I want to invite you to come forward and make possibly for the first time the decision to trust Him. And you come up here and say three very simple words, and we'll know exactly where to go. I want Jesus. Pretty simple, right? If you've never had a conversation with Him, I want to introduce you to Him tonight for possibly the first time. If you're battling sin, and you got that picture where sin starts out as that little kitty cat, but then turns into that all-consuming lion. If you've got repetitious sin in your life that you need to address tonight, I want to invite you to pray either right where you are or come up here to the altar and just kneel in humble, humble humiliation before Christ alone and pray to make those things right. There's nothing special about the stairs. It just puts us in a humble dialogue in the presence of Christ. If you believe, won't you come or won't you pray for somebody else and be that light?